Good evening and welcome. Just a quick welcome. My name is Thad Zolkowski. I'm the deputy director of the Leon Levy Center, a program which is founded and funded by Shelby White of the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007. As always, I'd like to thank Shelby for her steadfast support of the Biography Center. It's her vision that makes this program possible. As a writer, I've, all, I've had the good fortune to work with some superb editors, Elizabeth Schmitz, Karen Rinaldi. But like many writers, I have a tendency to forget their contributions during the long, bleak years when I'm not actively benefiting from them. And so I'm grateful to Bio for this noble and edifying celebration of legendary editors such as this year's honoree, Michael Corda. And that's all I have to say. Please welcome Steve Paul, president of Bio. Thank you, Thad. And thank you all for being here. I'm uh, just overwhelmed by, uh, by the energy in this room right now. Uh, we are so excited to have uh, uh, the opportunity to, to honor Michael. Um, and I'm gonna say even less than Thad said because uh, we, have, we have a lot of people who have a lot of really fun things to say, but I do wanna thank uh, Will Swift and Michael Gately, the executive director of BIO, uh, for all, and uh, Heather Clark, who's gonna be up here in a minute, uh, for making this evening happen. Um, we are just thrilled. Uh, we, had some, uh, we had some interesting moments in the last uh, couple of months, but it, uh, here we are. We made it. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that such a, uh, an august audience uh, I'm, uh, I'm almost uh, verklempt. But um, to get our program going, I'd like to invite Heather Clark, who was the chair of our uh, BIOS Awards Committee, and she is going to introduce some of our speakers. Heather? Thanks, Steve. Welcome and thank you all for coming tonight. We're grateful to have four speakers with us this evening who will share their personal tributes to Michael Corda. But before I introduce them, I'd like to read a couple of congratulatory messages from friends who were not able to be here tonight to celebrate in person. So the first message is from Joni Evans. She writes, it's ironic that we are celebrating Michael Corda tonight with this prestigious award for his work in biography when in my opinion, his most important biography was that of his own life, Another Life. While that book was described as a portrait of the book industry, it is in its pages that we come to understand how Michael came to be the genius that he is. The son and nephew of British theatrical royalty, educated at Magdalen College, Oxford, where his passion for history was ignited by Hugh Trevor Roper and Alan Bullock, and of course, his 40 plus year career in book publishing. As head of the editorial department of Simon & Schuster, his literary craft becomes unparalleled. He builds an all-star stable of authors, Carlos Castaneda, Larry McMurdy, Jackie Suzanne, Henry Kissinger, Presidents Nixon and Reagan, Harold Robbins, Graham Greene, Mary Higgins Clark, David McCulloch, and so many more. Over the years, he perfected his own skills for meticulous research, discerning analysis, and more importantly, unputdownable storytelling in the many books he began to write. When he turned to historical figures, his breadth of knowledge and insight into his subjects made his biographies read like novels. Ulysses Grant, Robert E. Lee, Lawrence of Arabia, General Eisenhower, all are not just informative, but deeply engaging. Even today, Michael Corda is writing a new biography of the poets of World War I to be published next spring. Subject dear to my own heart. In Michael Corda's hands, the stories of historical figures are profoundly intimate. So we thank you, Michael, for enriching us with your work and for enhancing the genre of biography. Congratulations. The next message is, is from Lynn Nesbitt who writes, 
There is no question that Michael Corda is a polymath, equestrian, pilot, editor, photographer. These were just a few of his talents that were cited at his 90th birthday celebration. For me, above all, Michael is a superior biographer and chronicler of major historical events. His special areas of interest are European, British, and American history, and he writes fluently and fluidly about a great range of topics. The Hungarian Revolution, T.E. Lawrence, Ulysses Grant, Robert E. Lee, Eisenhower, and Dunkirk are among the subjects of his many books. His upcoming book, Muse of Fire, World War I as Seen Through the Lives of the Soldier Poets, is about a subject that has passionately consumed him for some years. I found the book both harrowing and moving as he explored the lives of these young men, knowing that their roles in the military would most probably lead to their death. I began to recognize that there was a common theme in his biographies, which dealt with men who were thrust into extremis, often in wartime, yet were able to subjugate their human fears and act on behalf of what they perceived to be a greater good. Fear is a given, but it must be overcome. In thinking about the many years I have known Michael, it struck me that although he has suffered through serious illnesses, the long illness and death of his wife Margaret, and many other trying situations, he never complains, nor does he ever exhibit the slightest twinge of fear. Like the subjects he has written about, Michael moves ahead with courage, clarity, and stamina, always ready to face the vicissitudes that may confront him. I am so happy that he is being celebrated tonight as the superior writer and thinker that he is. And now I'd like to introduce the four speakers who will share their tributes to Michael tonight. Moira Hodgson is the author of the memoir, It Seemed Like a Good Idea at the Time, and a book about dance, Quintet, Five American Dance Companies. She's also written several cookbooks. She's been the senior editor at Vanity Fair, a food writer for the New York Times, a theater critic for The Nation, and restaurant critic for The New York Observer. And she currently reviews books for The Wall Street Journal. Robert Weil has been an editor in American publishing for 45 years. In 1998, he came to Norton as an executive editor, and in 2011, relaunched the Liverwright imprint, where he served as editor-in-chief for 11 years. He was the recipient of the Bio Editorial Excellence Award in 2017. He's edited three books by Michael Corda, including the forthcoming Muse of Fire. Victoria Wilson is vice president and executive editor at Alfred A. Knopf. She's the author of the acclaimed biography, A Life of Barbara Stanwyck. True, still true, and is at work on the concluding volume. And lastly, Simon Winchester is the New York Times bestselling author of over 20 books, including The Professor and the Madman, The History of Everything, and Krakatoa, The Day the World Exploded. He was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire in 2006 for his services to journalism and literature, and he is an honorary fellow at St. Catherine's College, Oxford. Thank you. Michael and I met for the first time four and a half years ago at a private screening that celebrated the 60th anniversary of The Third Man. The film was produced by his uncle, Alexander Corda, and Michael wrote about him and his illustrious filmmaking family in a best-selling memoir. Char am I, am I not? Shall I begin again? No. <laughs> in uh, his best-selling memoir, Charmed Lives. Every famous person in the latter half of the 20th century seems to make an appearance in this book, from Vivian Lee and Orson Welles to Graham Greene, who wrote the third man's screenplay. Michael gave a short talk about the film before the screening, and here is one line from it that evokes both Greene's and Michael's expressive prose. Greene captured that post-war period and mood perfectly, a brooding, sinister combination of guilt, fear, and denial without a single word of dialogue about it in the script, 
It's just there, the moral scabs of what remained of the once proud Austro-Hungarian Empire, now in 1948, a ruined Dickensian rookery of thieves, pimps, ex-war criminals, cheats, and rogues. Michael told me that the third man's zither music soundtrack became so popular that every time his uncle Alexander entered a posh restaurant, the band would strike up the tune, similar to the way the sound of God Save the King would greet the arrival of the monarch. Michael and I are enthusiastic supporters of the monarchy. One day, his wife, Maggie, sent me a question. How many monarchs has Michael lived through? <laughs> Five, I answered, except I didn't really think I should count Edward VIII, since he was never crowned. So that would realistically make four. She told Michael, who immediately wrote me, that, that at the moment the sovereign ceases to breathe, his or her successor becomes the sovereign. Hence, the herald announces, the king is dead, long live the king. The coronation has nothing to do with it. That merely celebrates the new king's accession and comes months afterwards. So there you have it, five monarchs. <laughs> By the way, both Michael and I like King Charles. Sitting next to Michael, that took a silence, I see. <laughs> Sitting next to Michael at lunch or dinner is like taking a walk through history. Before I met him, I assumed that with his pedigree and the astonishing number of books he's written and edited, he'd be rather lofty and unapproachable. Quite the contrary, he is warm and sympathetic with a seemingly endless supply of stories, many of them hilarious about events in his long life. They are rich with quirky detail, and he recounts them with humor and wit, looking almost conspiratorial in his telling, since he knows that you will both be entertained. Michael and I grew up listening to the BBC Evening News on the wireless, as we called it then. Leave it to him to reveal in one of his books that in his day, the broadcaster delivered the news in his sonorous, delivering the news in his sonorous upper class voice was required to wear black tie for the occasion, even though his listeners couldn't see him. Michael Hurl heard Churchill's fourth, first great war speech at the age of seven, sitting under a de Chirico painting with his father Vincent, who hated fanciness and drank out of an old glass jam jar filled with brandy. Vincent liked frayed clothes, seldom replaced his missing buttons, and sometimes used a piece of knotted string as a belt. Michael's style is rather different. In the late 1980s, he shocked one of his authors by appearing for a dinner at his house in suburban New Jersey in a silver Porsche. What the hell is that? exclaimed the host, Richard Nixon, sp <laughs> spying it among a sea of black limos. I think that Porsches may now be in Michael's past but he's always trim and compact and maintains an erect posture as befits an ex-RAF man, the insignia embroidered on the left-hand pocket of his jacket. Although to me, his neatly trimmed beard seems more Royal Navy than Royal Air Force. Among the group who convened on the night of the third man screening was Maggie Simmons, one of my dearest friends. After dinner, as guests began to leave, I noticed she and Michael were lingering together for a very long time by the door. A year and a half later, they were married. This led to my really getting to know me, him. He sent me copies of his speeches, such as the one he gave at his alma mater, Magdalen College in Oxford, about T.E. Lawrence, which seduced me into buying his biography, a tome of 792 pages. On October the 8th, Maggie gave a splendid 90th birthday lunch for Michael, at a winery in upstate New York. It was a gorgeous fall afternoon, and the picture windows of the dining room gave on to sweeping views of the valley and vineyards below. A fabulous day, as Michael put it afterwards, quoting Edward Lear. At the lunch, the writer and performer, Christopher Mason, sang a musical toast he called the Hungarian Nonagerian. He revealed that Michael, who has published 24 books, types with just two fingers. Christopher ended the song with the words, think how many more he could have written if he had learned to type with 10. <laughs> I believe that writing is as natural for Michael as breathing. If book number 25 is underway, I won't be surprised.
since the speakers tonight did not confer in advance, I think you're going to hear a little bit of a Rashomon effect of the same stories being told, yet in only different ways, as I've already noticed. I have to say that I'm truly honored to give a few words on behalf of Michael. I feel I'm in a unique position along with one of the other speakers, Victoria Wilson, in that I'm a fellow book editor with the additional privilege of being Michael's own editor for his last three books, including the forthcoming Muse of Fire, which Simon Winchester asked me not to mention by title, but since it's already been mentioned several times, I don't feel guilty. <laughs> but the good th there are, I can tell you a little bit of a hint of it, Simon, I know yours will be different. I've seen no, Michael's never written about World War I before, but I've never seen anyone tell the history of war, the drama of war through the lives of poets. That is, it is both examination of these poets, but also the most remarkable History, Jerry knows something else, but it's just, anyway, I, um, I find it, Simon will discuss, you know, the book, the book that I've edited at Future at more length. I think we're particularly privileged tonight in honoring Michael, and I should probably, I'll say it anyway, there's a room filled with a lot of editors, but Michael is America's greatest living editor. I don't think anyone here would challenge that comment. There's, it's simply, born in England in 1933, yes, as Moira said, he just had a lovely big birthday. He started work as a reader at Simon & Schuster in 1958, long before many of the people in this room were born. What is particularly remarkable about his calling, and I use that word deliberately as an editor, is that he eschewed the most likely route to success. He could have easily used his father's and his uncle's myriad Hollywood connections to become a successful movie person, since he himself had phenomenal connections. And here, you'll see, my jaw once dropped, I called him, and said, I just watched The Third Man, like in streaming. And Michael said, oh yes, I visited the set as a teenager after prep school as one summer in Vienna. And you know, and this is battered war, you know, war recovering in Austria. And he confided to me all this wonderful story. So Orson Welles only really didn't film the sewer scenes in Vienna but they had to be made for him in London and you should watch the breath of, you know, of the characters and things like that. You just pinch yourself and you say, my God, I'm working with this man. I mean, it's remarkable. But yet determined to be his own man, Michael chose publishing and in only a matter of years becoming the editor-in-chief of SNS and the most renowned editor in the country. Whereas most editors in American publishing, it really still pertains today, choose one direction or another, commercial versus literary, fiction versus nonfiction. Michael simply did it all. Editing everyone from, it's been mentioned, the novelist Larry McMurtry, whom I also worked with, who was the most amazing man and far more literary, Michael and I will tell you, than people would often ascribe to him, to, you know, someone as like Mary Higgins Clark, who was a wonderful lady, and you would mention that, to Jacqueline Suzanne or Joan Didion. I don't think they were ever in the same room, but you might, you might know otherwise to autobiographies that, as we've said, of four presidents, an achievement I suspect will never be equaled. My own first recollection of Michael in my 20s was seeing him huddled at a corner table at the Four Seasons with the then fiction editor of The New Yorker. You had no idea who I was. Not surprising for a man who had already written bestsellers like Power, How to Get It, how to use it, and success in the mid to late 1970s. All of this would suggest a man of aristocratic bearing, not perhaps as someone from a humbler background, 
Having now worked with Michael in his capacity as writer, memoirist, and historian ever since Lynn Nesbitt sold me the book about Churchill called Alone in 2014, I could say the opposite is true. Put Michael in a room with sales reps and he becomes the ultimate raconteur. You just feel you know him. Uh, and then there was a time one of our production editors, a little bit on the spectrum, spotted Michael in the Norton lobby and just excitedly chased him from Fifth Avenue all the way to Sixth Avenue, peppering him with questions as if he were a court of fanzine. Michael wasn't flummoxed in the least and effervescently, as is his wont, answered a barrage of questions on the thronged sidewalk of 42nd Street with the multitudes passing by. And this is my ex the experience that I've had with Michael Corda on all three books. The scholar turned writer, ever curious, always generous, both in his writing and in his actions, eager to affirm that through wisdom provided by books, the world can be, we continue to hope, a better place. Okay, here's my Rashomon version. <clears throat> so, I'm not sure I'm gonna be saying anything new as the third up, but I will give it a shot. So Michael was a historian long before he started to actually write history and biography. He was obsessed with World War II and the planes used in the war, and probably the guns and munitions as well. Michael was taken up with, of course, the Hungarian uprising of 1956. And if I'm not mistaken, he was a participant in it. And he was a student of battles, the battles that made history, changed history, and that were led by large military personalities. His knowledge of those and other convulsive events was overflowing, not simply with facts and connecting A to B, but with the rich storytelling around these monumental, decisive moments. The detail in the storytelling was impressive, but the narrative, then simply being told as in an adventure story, was riveting and was steeped in the excitement and scale of the battle skirmish campaign at hand and in the heroic figures at the center. It was clear in listening to Michael's retelling of these epic events that in addition to being a book publisher and editor-in-chief at Simon & Schuster, Michael was meant to be a writer of the history and lives of our time and of those who shaped our time in whatever century. And fortunately for us, for his, <clears throat> for us, for his readers and longtime admirers, Michael did indeed turn to writing and then to the writing of history and to the chronicling of the lives of those who made history. And with full tilt enthusiasm and all of the will and determination of a biographer on the hunt, and aren't we all when we're in the great game, as well as with supreme skill and perfect storytelling ease, size, and penetrating grasp, Michael became a first-rate biographer on the grand scale. Whether writing about the Battle of Britain or about our greatest military figures among them, Ulysses S. Grant or Dwight D. Eisenhower, bringing it all to life, whether it's Grant as a Mexican war officer, Civil War general, or President of the United States, or Eisenhower as our long-limbed people's general, as commander, shrewd military strategist, inspiring leader, and five-star hero whose generosity of spirit and strict sense of duty were crucial to our achieving victory, or whether it was Michael's writing about his own family of those charmed Hungarian adventurers led by the dazzling and flamboyant Uncle Alex, the most charismatic of all the Kellners, the towering force who became Sir Alexander Korda, Britain's most legendary movie maker, knighted by King George VI for outstanding services to the British film industry, or Michael setting his sights on and writing about the legendary, even mythic T.E. Lawrence, British soldier, scholar, and adventurer. Congratulations, Michael, <clears throat> on being the recipient of this richly deserved award, and on to your next subject. Well, so I'm picking up the table scraps here, but um, 
I was the Jewish Museum on Fifth Avenue, way uptown, had a big ex exhibition this year devoted to the Sassoons, which I found enormously enjoyable. And because I had spent a lot of my time in Shanghai where the Sassoons and the Kaduris, Baghdad Sephardic Jews, made fortunes and influence, which they then spent on vast collections of art and beautiful houses in England and remarkable people they were. In my view, the most remarkable of all was the then young Siegfried Sassoon. And in, towards the end of the exhibit, there was devoted to Siegfried Sassoon, a young officer in the British Army, his notebook, small, elegant little notebook, covered with mud and one suspects blood as well, in which with his impeccable handwriting, there was the draft of the very famous speech, he, the denunciation of the war that he wished to have delivered and indeed, thanks to the influence of Bertrand Russell, was read in the House of Commons, nearly got him thrown out of the army, but in the end everyone realized what he realized, the awful futility, the pain, the horror of war, because up to that point, most of the British poets who had been involved in wars Kipling, of course, most notably, but uh, and to an extent, Rupert Brooke, um, they lionized war and heroism and all the good aspects of it. But people like Edmund Blunden and Wilfred Owen and Robert Graves, who actually were in the Great War, as it was called at the time it was being fought, realized that this was just too awful, too awful for words, and you should no longer lionize it or fall back on patriotism, things like that. And there haven't been war poets since. I don't think in the Second World War there were any significant poets, although the British, to their credit, always sent artists to war. So there were official war artists chronicling the awful things that went on in the trenches in 1914 to 18, but then again in the Second World War and even in the Falklands War in which I was prolif peripherally involved, a war artist was dispatched, but no poetry. The poets, the great poets, particularly Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, their legacy was to define and remind us all of the awfulness of war. And thus, I believe firmly that the new book that Michael has finished, and which is, I've got a copy of here, Muse of Fire, the quotation I think is from Shakespeare, Henry V, um, is a staggering and very personal work, looking at the awfulness of war through the eyes of these half a dozen, nine or 10 maybe, poets like Siegfried Sassoon, whose legacy is in my view, eternal. And of course, the First World War, and as, as Michael remarks in his preface, which was the decisions made after it, most notably, of course, at the Versailles Peace Conference, um, the war began 110 years ago, and we still live amid its ruins, its errors of judgment, and its fatal consequences. One of the fatal consequences, no less, of course, is being fought out at the moment in Gaza, because it was us, who drew the lines, it was us who, the Balfour Declaration and all the rest of it that led to this extraordinary situation for which I think all of us in this room, no matter our personal affiliation, will think that a ceasefire has got to happen. And that, reading this book, this excellent book, made me think more than ever that this war, however horrible its beginnings, has, has to be brought to an end. So I think Michael has done us a great service. I'm sure it won't be his last book. I mean, he's a mere 90, and I'm sure there'll be many more to come. But I think, despite the magnificence of the biographies, the amusement, I, uh, to me, because he's a near neighbor up in the countryside, his book about coming into the country and leaving a rigorously urban life and moving into a, a more rural one strikes many, many chords with me. And man to man, I found personally very, very affecting. And his great biography is, of course, wonderful. But this, mainly because it echoes and has so much resonance with what's going on today, I think will be the book for which he 
will be remembered most of all. It's an extraordinary book and congratulations to Bob for editing it so brilliantly and also of course to Michael for coming up with the idea and writing it so, so beautifully. And so what I want to do is, and I've done this once for Michael before, but I don't know, I don't believe this poem is included in the book, but it's Edward Thomas, I'm going to read it, it's very short so you won't need to go to sleep for very long. Um, Edward Thomas was to go to war, but before he went to the trenches in 1915, he was going to visit his friend Robert Frost, who happened to be in England at the time, in Worcester. And he took the train from Oxford to Worcester, a train which, thanks to the merciless brutalism of Lord Beeching, who tore up so many 6,000 miles of branch lines in England in the 1960s, the Oxford to Worcester line was, I think, a single track railway running through the Cotswolds. And on the day that Edward Thomas took the train, it stopped at a station with the strange name of Adelstrop. And to me, because of what then happened, this poem remains an evocation of an England that probably barely exists today. But I know that Michael, for all his enthusiasm for the American countryside and for all his involvement in American literature and life in New York and so on and so forth, he retains a deep, profound nostalgia for England. And this is a very English poem, which I'm going to briefly ring, read to you. Adelstrop by Edward Thomas. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name, and willows, willow herb and grass and meadow sweet, and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute, a blackbird sang close by, and round him, mistier, father and father, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Edward Thomas went to war three weeks later, and two weeks later, he was killed. So, Michael, with that small testament of my affection for you and a memory of a war which still, 110 years later, is raging in another form. Congratulations, we love you dearly, thank you. Hi, I'm Will Swift, and when we founded the uh, Editorial Excellence Award 10 years ago, we might have given it to Michael. We happened to give it to his colleague, uh, 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 Robert Gottlieb, uh, but I would say this, in, this is our 10th anniversary, and what wonderful bookends to the two great editors of the last 100 years, Michael and Robert Gottlieb. So congratulations. I want to give you a brief hellos from people. Kitty Kelly, who Michael edited her Elizabeth Taylor book, she sends her very fond regards. She's in Washington having a medical test. Kai Bird, the director of the center here, uh, the Leon Levy Center for Biography. He wanted very much to be here, but he stupidly, in his words, uh, agreed to go to Rome for one day today to uh, prom promote his book on uh, Oppenheimer and, and as the movie opens in Rome. And also, um, Jonathan Siegel, did he send you an email today, Michael? Did you get one? Yeah, he, he also asked me to send his very fond regards to you. Um, so, and I want to thank Maggie. It's great to work with a person who is as obsessive as I am. Between the two of us, we, we really worked hard with, with Michael and, and Steve to make this event happen. Um, Michael, why don't you come up for a minute? I want to ask you a question. Thank you, Michael. Put that there. Um, 
I met Michael this summer for the first time uh, at a lovely luncheon party at his home with he and Maggie through our mutual friends, uh, Betsy and Peter. And uh, I walked into the kitchen and my first meeting with Michael was in his kitchen. And you remember what you said to me, Michael? <laughs> I, I remember who I was quoting. <laughs> yes, well, I should say that I've written a book on the Nixons and he edited all of Richard's, Nixon's post-presidency books. So what did you say to me, Michael? <laughs> uh, Richard Nixon would begin any dinner party by coming downstairs and standing <clears throat> on the first landing and saying to the people who were assembled to have dinner with him, he would say, um, uh, gentlemen, uh, the good news is the bar is open. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would always serve his favorite drink, which was a daiquiri, which was made to his own recipe, which was, by the way, the best daiquiri recipe I have ever known. And you never got to finish your glass, because as you took a sip, he would say, uh, Manolo, I'll top up Mr. Corden's glass. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so this, I asked Michael to join me for this because this demonstrates one of the trifecta of character qualities that makes Michael so remarkable. He's utterly charming. He had me at hello. After that, after Richard Nixon tried to serve me a drink, a, a daiquiri, which I don't drink, I was hooked. Um, the, so the sec we all know people who are charming, or many of us know people who are brilliant. And, and many of us also know people who have a very warm and kind heart. But not often do we meet somebody who has all three qualities, a great warm heart, brilliance, and utter charm. And that is, and we're not only honoring Michael tonight as an incredible author, but we're also honoring him as an incredible man who's given so many contributions to so many people. And from the literary side, this is one of the great reads I've had in the last 20 years. This is his memoir, Another Life, which tells the story of 40 years in publishing and every possible person. And Michael is, is able to depict character with flaws and eccentricities in an extraordinary way. And if you want to know about William Schreier, Will and Ariel Durant, Harold Robbins, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Kitty Kelly, Joan Crawford, Graham Greene, and so many others, and just be absolutely, utterly fascinated. Please get yourself a copy of this book. It's a wonderful way to continue our celebration tonight. So, Michael, we would like to present you the award as a remarkable editor, Thank you. writer, reader, and man. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to invite myself to your house to make sure that's on Absolutely. your desk. It is going to be on my desk. It's pride <laughs> of place. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Um, and um, thank all of you who spoke for your very kind words, which I um, uh, deeply appreciate and am deeply moved by. From the time I started reading, I read biography. I don't think I ever read a novel until I got to boarding school in Switzerland in 1947 and was required to read in French Alain Fournier's Le Grand Monde, a slow read, by the way, if ever there was one, which further convinced me that reading biographies was more fun. From an early age, I had the unfettered run of my father's books, which filled and overfilled shelves and tables all over our house. He didn't mind what I read, provided I was reading, rather than distracting him from collecting art and designing the sets for my Uncle Alex's movies. The sight of me with a book in my hands, the heavier the better, reassured him that I was not wasting my time and also was not going to bother him with questions or what he would call chit-chat. 
It also taught me a lifetime lesson that there is a big difference between doing nothing and sitting in a chair reading a book. <laughs> reading a book is a respected activity. No child holding a book in their hands is considered to be wasting their time by adults, even if the child's eyes are firmly closed. <laughs> My father was not a reader of fiction. He preferred biographies and history in English, French, German, and of course his native Hungarian. And his bedside table was piled high with whatever he was reading, since he tended to switch back and forth between books, as I do, rather than to read one straight through before starting another. The first grown-up book I remember reading was Carola O'Man's humongous Nelson. And I dived into it like someone entering a swimming pool, unable to stop reading. I should explain that my father had designed the sets for my Uncle Alex's That Hamilton Woman, that most English of historical epics, starring Larry Olivier as Nelson and Vivian Lee as Lady Hamilton, although practically everybody involved on the production side of the film was Hungarian. Hence the presence of Carola Oman's classic biography of Admiral Nelson on my father's shelves. Due to a misunderstanding between the two brothers, the film was being made in a hurry, the first set my father built was for the Duke of Wellington's library in Brussels just before the Battle of Waterloo. And when Alex saw it, he said to my father, what the hell is this, Vinci Cam? I meant the bloody admiral, not the bloody general. My father and his boys had to turn Wellington's library into Lady Hamilton's bedroom overnight, <laughs> with the Bay of Naples outside the window and Nelson's ship, HMS Agamemnon, floating in it, firing a salute. The word impossible does not exist in Hungarian, apparently. <laughs> Perhaps not surprisingly, the next biography I read because it was next to Carola Oman's Nelson on the Shelf, was Sir Arthur Bryant's The Great Duke, His Life of the Duke of Wellington, which got me started on reading biographies of 18th century figures and for a lifelong fascination with military history. I developed a certain unhealthy fixation on the Prince Regent, later King George IV, whose life has inspired countless biographies, and by the time I arrived at La Rose, my boarding school in Switzerland, at the age of 13, I knew more about Georgian life, literature, and politics than any other people there, more certainly than was good for me. I even took to carrying an antique sterling silver snuff box in my pocket. <laughs> to this day, I still feel almost as much at home in the 18th century as in my own. And when I read a book like Stacey Schiff's wonderful biography of Samuel Adams, nothing in it seems to me quaint or unfamiliar or long ago. L.P. Hartley's famous line, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there, is certainly true up to a point. But to a biographer, the interesting thing about human lives on the contrary is the degree to which they do things the same. They are moved by the same needs, the same weaknesses, the same concerns from generation to generation, from one century to the next. The political reality in which they live may change as do their clothes, but in their innermost life, people are more alike than not, from the ancient Romans to ourselves. And part of a biographer's task is to pierce through the obvious things that separate us from people of other times and illuminate, that is, bring to life the person within. Even the great monsters of history ha have his or her human side, after all, from Hitler's love of dogs to Ivan the Terrible's remorse for the killing of his son or Attila the Hun's apparent fondness for his son. It is one of Stacey Schiff's great achievements, by the way, that she took Cleopatra out of the midst of myth and turned her into someone we feel we know and whose motives we understand. 
One of the books I reread most often is Garrett Mattingly's The Defeat of the Spanish Armada because of the masterly way in which he combines the, quote, big picture, unquote, of history with brilliant sections of biography, not to speak of a profound knowledge of sailing and seamanship into a single narrative. Another is Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, which again combines wonderful biographies of each of the major characters within a brilliant narrative of the first month of World War I. I have never forgotten the sharp cutting edge of her portrayal of Field Marshal Sir John French, the volatile commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force. So clearly, the wrong man in the wrong place at a critical moment of history, yet somehow in her hands also an appealing and perhaps all too human figure who might have stepped out of the pages of a Nancy Mitford novel. Writing history tends to make us take the long view, the big view, to describe sweeping vistas and big events while writing biography tends to make us concentrate, to seek out the small events, the unexpected words or actions that reveal the person behind the mask or the legend. Biography is not about sweeping theories of history. It is about facts, about what people felt, saw, did, wrote. There's a wonderfully touching story about a state visit of Queen Victoria's to Paris in the mid-19th century, that as she and the Empress Eugenie sat down in the imperial box at the Paris Opera, Eugenie glanced briefly behind her as she sat down to make sure her chair was slipped into place, whereas Queen Victoria sat down without looking behind her. From childhood, she had always been confident that her chair would be put in place by someone as she sat. It was the difference between one who was born to royalty and one who came to it unexpectedly later in life. These are the little human touches that make biography different from history and very often give us a better view of the past than lengthy descriptions of battles or political debates. To the biographer, every little thing is useful if it illuminates a character or a personality. It is inevitably portraiture rather than the big vista, but arguably it is the best way of presenting or explaining history. Disraeli wrote, that he read no history, quote, nothing but biography, for that is life without theory, unquote. And who would know better? For what is history but the sum total of people's lives? By examining one person's life in the context of their time, we are likely to learn more about that time than by sweeping descriptions of events. When the Abbe C.S. was asked what he did during the French Revolution, he replied simply, Je l'ai survécu. I survived it. Which tells us more about what the revolution was like than a dozen heavy histories of the terror. By putting the human element back into history, the biographer gives us a true picture of what the past was like. For it is not in descriptions of the great historical set pieces that we form a meaningful picture of the past, but in the lives of people great and small, what they thought, what they said, what they wrote to each other, how they felt about the events going on around them, that we understand what was actually happening. I am often asked whether I like the people I write about. But I think a more important question is to keep an open mind about them. Writing a biography is an adventure, a journey of discovery. It is only as you begin to read about your subject and above all to read his or her letters that you really begin to know him or her. 
I rather vaguely admired Ike when I set out to write a biography of him, but it was only as I began to understand his family, to think about how unusual it was for a boy from a Mennonite family, all devoted pacifists, to go to West Point, become a soldier to his mother's horror, and then on to being a supremely successful general, that I began to like him and to realize how complicated the real man was behind that famous big grin. The same was true for Ulysses S. Grant, who at first seemed to me like an unpromising subject, but whose character snapped into focus when I read about his first encounter with the enemy in 1861, when he led his fledgling regiment towards the camp of a Confederate colonel who had been harassing local farmers in Missouri over the brow of a hill to attack. As he did so, he thought, quote, I would have given anything to be back in Illinois, but I had not the moral courage to halt, unquote. A thing not many four-star generals would late to ad later admit to, but when he discovered that the Confederates had fled at his approach, he realized that the Confederate colonel was, quote, as much afraid of me as I had been of him, unquote, and reflected that was a view of the question that I had never taken before, but it was one I never forgot afterwards. Like I, unholstering his pistol, getting out of his car, and moving forward on foot when his driver mistakenly drove him into the front line in Tunisia in 1942 in the middle of a firefight. It was a moment that firmly defined Grant's no-nonsense calm, courage, and good sense. It was that same steadiness that marked Grant's character when Sherman rode up, dismounted, walked up to him in the pouring rain on the night of the first day of the Battle of Shiloh to find his commander-in-chief sitting huddled up under a tree, smoking a cigar after what was then the bloodiest day in American history. Grant hated the smell and sight of blood. He would not eat meat, even turkey, unless it was well done, like shoe leather and all the barns and houses around the battlefield were being used by surgeons chopping off limbs, the last thing he wanted to see. So he was sitting outside in the riot. Sherman, who at that point did not know him well, walked up to him leading his horse and said, well, General Grant, we sure took a licking today. To which Grant replied calmly, yep, be in tomorrow, though, and he did. It is these little human touches that frankly make biography such a treat to write. The constant small discoveries that make one say, oh, he or she couldn't have said that or done that or thought that. They are the equivalent of opening a surprise Christmas present from under the tree and unwrapping it to discover it was exactly what I had been hoping for. The only thing more enjoyable than writing a biography is reading one. So it is an honor, as well as a pleasure, to be here tonight among people who have shared the pleasures, the surprises, and the occasional sadnesses of delving deeply into someone else's life. Most biographers, I think, end up loving the person they are writing about, despite his or her flaws and mistakes, or otherwise it would be hard indeed to spend the several years in the company of a total stranger one dislikes. I am in awe of Bob Carroll, who spent 49 years in the overbearing company of Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> and certainly I have come to think of my subjects, at least, as friends, whose company I enjoy, whose mistakes I try to avoid, and whose example I try to follow. I can't think of any other kind of reading that over the years has given me more pleasure. I can't think of any other kind of writing that has given me such a deep thirst to know more um, and to write more about the people I like and admire. Thank you.